Labor's Daniel Andrews makes history, securing a third term and reshaping politics in Victoria. The political trends witnessed at the May federal election continued. It was another tough night for the Liberal brand as voters continued to desert the major parties. I'm David Spears. Welcome to Insiders. We're heading into the final week of federal parliament for the year, and it's going to be a busy one. The Albanese government has a raft of legislation it wants passed, including its contentious industrial relations reforms. We can reveal this weekend the government has had a major breakthrough in its negotiations and is now very confident of passing this bill. We'll speak to Tony Burke about that this morning. We're going to start, though, with an historic election night in Victoria, which has confirmed some of the trends in Australian politics witnessed when voters turfed out the Morrison government in May. Daniel Andrews has won a third election, the first Premier to do so, since Victoria introduced fixed four-year terms. His fist pump last night said it all, and there it is on both Melbourne papers this morning. Hope defeats hate, says the Sunday Age. Dan Slam on the front of the Sunday Herald Sun. At the close of counting last night, the ABC's Anthony Green said Labor had 49 seats, a clear majority, with the Coalition on 24, the Greens on 4 and 11 in doubt. Labor could win as many as 55 seats, the Liberals only 19 and the Nationals 9. The primary vote confirms this continued shift away from the major parties. Labor's statewide vote down nearly 6%. The biggest falls were in Melbourne's Outer West. The Liberal vote also fell a further 0.7%, down to below 30% now. The Nationals, well, they had a better night, increasing their vote and their seats in Parliament. The Greens lifted their vote. The Teal Independents at this stage appear not to have won a seat. After preferences, the swing to the Coalition was 3.3%, well short of what it needed. The ABC state political reporter Richard Willingham joins me now. Rich, explain to us how the political landscape in Victoria shifted last night. Well, once again, it has cemented Victoria very much as a Labor state, David. The Labor problems, their, their swing against them was mainly in areas where it is very safe, Labor territory in the west and north of Melbourne. Now, these are areas that were very safe, so there was some fat they could be trimmed. These are areas that were particularly hard hit by the pandemic. The real story of this election, though, was east of the Yarra. This is an area that once was controlled east, almost solely by the Liberal Party. They lost ground to Daniel Andrews in 2018 and they failed to pick them up again. They failed to win in urban areas in Melbourne, particularly areas that are more middle class and more affluent and people who were, I guess, not as affected by lockdown, the so-called laptop class. And Labor's capitalised on that. They've made big wins there. They've held their line. And that's, that's a big story. The big story is about where do the Liberal parties go from here. And also the fact that Daniel Andrews, in the face of lots of campaigning against him and media, Victorians have once again backed in. You noted that the primary vote for the major parties has dropped. The Teals have made a march, but we're not sure if they're going to pick up any seats yet. The Greens were last night claiming a green slide, but at the moment it looks like they're only going to pick up one. So very much this is a, a big win for Labor. The other thing to note, this wasn't a, all a doom and gloom for the Coalition. The Nationals had a particularly good night. They picked up three extra seats in the country and country independence, despite a lot of hype about that they may be very successful, have actually gone backwards. What about the, the two leaders? An historic win for Daniel Andrews, a shocker for the Liberals. What does it now mean for the two respective leaders? Well, I think for Daniel Andrews, it sort of cements his status as Victorian Labor legend. Um, he can now write his own ticket about what he wants to do next. He has to serve a few more months and he'll get a statue in bronze reserved for pre long-serving premiers just over there at one treasury place. For, for Matthew Guy, this is a two-time loser to Daniel Andrews and it's not just been honourable losses. They've been thumped both times. Questions are being raised about why he even came back, why the Liberals decided to go not to undermine Michael O'Brien and, and not stick with him in, in such tough circumstances. Circumstances. Obviously, there's going to be a lot of soul-searching about 
who comes next. And as you know, their party room could only be 19 MPs, so it's very few people to choose from. Some prospective potential leaders have lost. Louise Staley is losing Ripon, and we don't know yet whether John Pesciuto will actually get elected. A lot of hope that he might get elected in Hawthorne, but that's just not certain yet. So there's going to be lots of soul-searching for the Liberal Party. They find themselves in this situation again four years later after promising to fix their problems. It appears that has just not happened. Rich, thank you very much for, uh, for that. Well, the Premier, Dan Andrews, joins me in a moment. First, here with the two leaders explaining last night's result. We respect the right of every Victorian to choose their government. We respect the right of Victorians to vote how they vote and respect the outcome of this election. We say to each and every Victorian, the choice you make is yours and we respect that. We intend to, as you'd expect, hold the government in the next term to account for what they've committed and for the important issues that are raised on behalf of Victorians uh, to them in the parliament. Leadership isn't about doing what's popular. Leadership is about doing what's right. Yeah. Leadership is about doing what matters. Yeah. And that's exactly what the people of this great state have endorsed today in resoundingly re-electing our strong, stable, majority Labor government. Well, here he is, Premier. Congratulations on the win. Welcome to the program. Thank you very much, David. Good to be with you. Did you get any sleep last night? Uh, not very much. <laughs> right. Look, there was a moment there, we just saw it, where you took to the stage, securing this, uh, this third victory, and you, you, know, you had the fists pumped. It, it looked like a moment of, of vindication after a very tough few years for the state and for, no doubt for you and your family as well. Is that, is that what it was? David, my politics has never been about the win. It's always about the work. You've got to win to do that. But I grew up being taught every day that with opportunity comes a profound obligation to do your best, to work hard, to do what matters. And that's exactly what I've delivered over these last eight years. And I'm humbled and so grateful, so, so grateful that Victorians have re-elected a majority Labor government. But give us a bit of a sense of that, that personal feeling, because we could see it in your face. Well, this has been... Our politics may well be divided, but our community is absolutely united. We got vaccinated. We looked out for each other. Those acts of kindness and compassion. It makes you so proud to lead the best state in our nation and a state that has a faith in science, a state that is prepared to make big sacrifices to save tens of thousands of lives. It's not about being vindicated, it's about our positive plan being endorsed and now getting the opportunity and having that profound obligation to get things done. There were, however, some big swings against Labor, uh, particularly in those outer suburban seats. Your primary vote across Melbourne's northwest suburbs fell by around 9%. Um, these are suburbs that did it particularly tough during Indeed. the COVID lockdowns. Yes. Um, they, they couldn't work from home, many of them. Um, what do you put those swings down to? Well, I think the point you make in relation to not being able to work from home and things of that nature, that's why being in work is so important. And, of course, our political opponents were going to cancel projects and... What, you, what happens when you cancel projects? You're cancelling jobs. So we'll work with all those communities and we'll work really hard so to this... make sure that we deliver. And, and not just those communities. I, I'm fully aware that whilst we've been resoundingly re-elected, there are many Victorians who didn't vote for us and we'll govern for them too. Do That's an though, important part of my job. Is this part of a, a longer term, broader shift in those outer suburbs away from Labor, not just at the state level, but federally as well? Well, I live in the suburbs and uh, this is the whole thing, David. Sometimes things that are big on Spring Street, and for your national audience, that's where our parliament is, and they've got nothing to do with what's on Main Street. I get my advice from my neighbours, from my local community, and I'll continue to work hard, and there's, there's some work to do there, that sense of healing, that sense of unity. And the best way to do that, you talk about uh, integrity, lots of talk about integrity in this election. Integrity in politics is doing what you said you'd do. And that's exactly what I will. Well, you also said last night, you quoted uh, Paul Keating, uh, who said, told you that leadership isn't about doing what's popular, it's about doing what's right. Um, look, one issue here, Australia is facing an energy price crisis at the moment. It may not be popular, particularly in some of those seats, you're you know, battling with the Greens in the inner, inner areas of Melbourne. But are you prepared to shift your position at all on the issue of gas to deal with this energy crisis? Well, first thing, Paul Keating's a very good friend of mine and I'm honoured to be able to say that. Secondly, when it comes to energy, the cheapest form of new energy is renewable energy. That is a fact. 
it's not a fossil fuel future that we need. On gas, I'm very encouraged. My discussions with Prime Minister uh, Albanese uh, have been very positive. We need a gas reserve, our gas for our businesses and our households. That's what's really, really important. Uh, uh, what we don't need, export that to the world and get the best price you can. But our view on gas... You're talking about, about national gas. Right? That's exactly right. I'd do a state one if I could. OK, but you've but been talking constitutionally, about... we simply can't. OK, so you've talked so, to the Prime Minister about a national gas reserve. A national gas reserve or some other mechanism to control prices. These companies are making Australians pay European prices. Now, yes, there's a terrible war going on in Europe. We're not in Europe. Mm. We're a long way from Europe. Our gas ought to be for our households and our businesses first. And what we don't need, sell it, by all means. And is the PM going to do that? Well, that'll be a matter for the PM. Right. But I'll tell you what, David, when it comes to energy policy, we've got a federal government and a prime minister who's got an agenda. We've had nine wasted years and we're so... It, it, things are so much more challenging today because we've had a, a sort of revolving door of energy ministers and no coherent energy policy. Albo is turning that around and that's good for households, good for jobs and really good for the planet too. Just Finally, I mean, this was a this was a toxic campaign uh, at times. There's been a lot of negativity, um, a lot of very ugly and even threatening things have been have been said. Did you ever have any second thoughts uh, about going around for another four years? No, I'm all about making sure that we get things done, and I've had great opportunity in my life. And as I said before, I was brought up to to know at a really elemental level that if you've had opportunity, then you are obliged. I just say this, David. Our politics may well be divided. But our Victorian community has been absolutely united, getting vaccinated, sticking together, acts of kindness, acts of compassion. And I'm so grateful and proud that Victorians have re-elected a majority Labor government, but will govern for everyone, regardless of how they voted. Our positive plan benefits all Victorians, and so will the work of our government. And you will serve a full four-year term? Yes, I will. It's the greatest honour of my life. You won't be retiring early? It's the greatest honour of my life and I'm here to get things done. It's what I've always done and I'm so thrilled to be able to do it for another four years. Daniel Andrews, uh, congratulations once again. Thanks for joining us this morning. Thanks for having us on. Well, let's get to our panel. We're joined this morning by Nikki Sava, James Campbell and Catherine Murphy. Very good morning to all of you. Plenty to talk about this morning. Uh, I want to start, though, with what's just happened in Victoria because it is uh, quite, a, quite an amazing result in many ways. Nikki, how would you explain what we've just witnessed? Well, um, I think uh, there was a lot of misreading um, in the lead up to the election about uh, feelings about Daniel Andrews. I mean, I do think there were Victorians who wanted to give him a bit of a boot up the backside. Um, so there was a preparation to do that. But they would look at him and then look at Matthew Guy and the Liberals and they would think, we just can't go there. So it turned out to be a very devastating result for the Liberal Party. They made up uh, very little ground. I think they ran the wrong kind of campaign. And Andrews, in the end, obviously ran a very good campaign because he held most of his ground. Yes, they did lose a couple of seats uh, to the Greens and uh, the Libs picked up one or two there, but it was a dismal, devastating result for the Liberal Party. Why was it a dismal, devastating result, James? Well, uh, have we got an hour? <laughs> uh, Where did it go so wrong? Well, it's, it went wrong at all levels. If you, I mean, look, let's start, I'll start with the positive. There are, there are a few tiny positives for them. Mm. Uh, they have secured large 2 PP swings uh, in, in, in parts of Melbourne. Problem was, the areas which are very, which they're a very, very large Labor vote, and it's going to wasn't enough for them to break through on seats. Uh, the Liberal Party uh, campaign infrastructure is still not fit for purpose. Well, just on that, I, I was I was told that um, Liberal MPs were informed on Wednesday by the party head office that they were going to win the election, uh, and there's a lot of anger at the pollster and the the campaign secretary. Yeah, so the, the, that, that, the, the spin divides two ways on this. The, those close to the pollster and the friends of the pollster will say, no, 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 the polling was right at the time, it's just that everything went wrong uh, in the last, last week. Hours. It just happened that everything went wrong <laughs> the last time. The same uh, four years ago, same pollster, same problem. There was this tremendous mm -hmm. swing away, but, you know, the, the word... Fancy that they get it wrong every yeah, no, time. Well, no, the, 
That's just... It was, no, no, it was right, Nikki. The polling was right. It was just the wrong time. That was all. Mm. Right. I mean... They've got problems. They've got... They got massive... You mentioned, you mentioned the, the, the some nuggets of good news for the Liberals, and one, Catherine, is um, they've held off, it looks like, the Teal independence yep. uh, in queue. Yep. Uh, Jess Wilson uh, looks like she's won that seat. And even in Hawthorne, we were talking about John Pesuto, who may emerge as the, the new leader, we'll see. His nose is in front in the mm. count in Hawthorne. Mm. Doesn't look like Teals have managed to break through and win a seat here. Now, it's worth noting Q and Hawthorne both fall in the federal seat mm. of uh, Kuyong. You're not which... lining up the second coming of Josh Frydenberg. <laughs> well, and what would he be David? thinking if he's weighing a second coming, having a look at those state results and thinking maybe there is a, a pathway? Mm, gosh, let's think about that for a moment. What would he be thinking? Hmm. Um, well, look, I think uh, we, we had the opening of uh, Josh Frydenberg's return to government campaign in Nikki Sabah's excellent book that we will all read <laughs> we'll get to that. in a week or so. Which his so colleagues think, did not oh, appreciate. I wouldn't I have put it quite the... like that. No, but... no, I think that was the opening salvo. I think uh, last night uh, we saw uh, the Liberal Party uh, hold on to uh, key geographical territory in his electorate of Kuyong. So I think we'll be uh, seeing the Treasurer thinking about a return to the well, he federal would be. He would be. arena. I mean, yeah, he absolutely... But, Why do those teals, though, do you think, just on them, uh, not succeed where they did federally it's because of Morrison not being on the well, well, on the ticket on the scene. Yeah, well, I think there's a couple of interesting takeouts from this election campaign. Just quickly, at the helicopter level, what we can see is there's this massive realignment happening in the Australian electorate at the moment. Yep. This shift away from major parties. Uh, an imminent quarterly essay may actually go to some of these Written points. by the one and only Sorry, had Catherine to do Murphy. That. Um, anyway, That's how we've got week. products yeah. today. <laughs> <laughs> I feel no, like I'm on no, no, but, TV. No, no, but serious point. Uh, realignment's on. Uh, the Labor Party thus far is winning the realignment war. They did federally. They did at the state level. Both of those results could have resulted in minority governments. It didn't in either contest. Mm. In terms of the Teals, this is very interesting in Victoria. And there's a real lesson here for Peter Dutton, if he's listening. Because uh, the Liberals were able to, despite a disastrous campaign and a pollster who can't read numbers or whatever... Um, uh, the, the Liberal and National parties, both the coalition partners, had a decent climate policy in this state. And so they were able to hold elements of their own progressive... Not just territory. hold, That's not just hold. This, this is an interesting point, because the Nationals actually gained ground. They won yes. back some of their seats. Now, the Nationals in Victoria are far more pro-climate action more. mob than federally uh, for the more. Nationals. And we see Peter Dutton in Canberra doing some, you know, weird, weird Tony Abbott reboot... Um, despite seeing a federal result and now a state result that suggests that that is quite dangerous as a political strategy. And I think the Liberal Party is in danger at this point of becoming a regional party. We're in danger of a reverse coalition where the National Party is the dominant player in the coalition. I'm, I know people will say that's hyperbolic and, and it probably is at this point in time, but the Liberal Party is, is at the moment performing very weakly in metropolitan Australia and Labor is doing a better job of holding the middle ground. They, they are. And, and, and Peter Dutton needs to look at that very seriously. And, and, but this is a problem. When, when people aren't there, they can't advocate for the seats you've lost. The, prob the, 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 the Liberal Party, if, 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 yeah. you know, if, there's, if, if the, teal, the teal seats disappeared, the voice of those voters inside the coalition room is no longer heard. Before we get, move off this, can I just go back to the teals for a second? And, and the implications for New South Wales. The federal election has no fundraising caps and no spending caps. In Victoria, we now have very, very strict fundraising caps, and in New South Wales, they have spending caps. This is the, 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 the result down here suggests, you know, reinforces the importance of the role of money in politics. Mm. And if you can't get it or you can't spend it, it's very, very difficult to make in ground, inroads if you're not uh, an established party. But money is important, right? Everybody uh, agrees with that. Candidates are also very important. And I think what happened uh, federally mm. was not only that they had a lot of money to draw on, but they had exceptional candidates. And uh, they will still be there. Yeah, these candidates um, were not as next. good. These candidates were um, kind of at a next level lower down and um, it wasn't the same kind of sentiment around either. I mean, the, the thing in uh, Kuyong last time 
really was to get rid of Morrison. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was the prime objective of the voters there and they voted very strategically. Uh, so Morrison is gone. Does that mean they're going to come back? Well, maybe, depending on um, the results yesterday in Kew and Hawthorne, were very encouraging for uh, Frydenberg, but Dutton is still leader and Dutton will not be a popular leader in those electorates. Well, There's no doubt about that. And, um, and I think um, there's still going to be um, a hard road ahead for Frydenberg on yeah, that front. No, no doubt. Let's move on to um, what you've been writing about in your book. And uh, it's great to have you back after uh, the completion of your, your after book. After my hibernation. Uh, <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, look, we've already had a bit of a taste of uh, something that's in it, and that's in relation to the secret Morrison ministries. And in fact, on Friday, we saw released the report, uh, the inquiry report from the high, former High Court Judge uh, Virginia Bell that looked into uh, all of this. Um, the Prime Minister, Anthony Albanese, did raise some concern about the level of cooperation from Scott Morrison with this inquiry. Mr Morrison did not agree to meet with Virginia Bell and communicated only through his lawyers. That contradicts the very clear statement that Scott Morrison said when this inquiry was announced, and I think will come as a surprise to people who took those comments at face value. Ms Bell described Scott Morrison's various accounts and explanations for his conduct, to quote the report, as not easy to understand and difficult to reconcile. Yeah, Catherine, not easy to understand, difficult to reconcile. Sounds like Virginia Bell was utterly unconvinced <laughs> with Scott Morrison's well, justification. Well, bamboozled like the rest of us. I imagine. Uh, it is a very interesting report, though, that she's delivered. Uh, I think there are all kinds of interesting insights into that. It's sort of more than what the hell was that, although there's a fair bit of what the hell was that. Uh, the thing that sort of stuck out to me as being really interesting in, the, in sort of going to the Prime Minister or former Prime Minister's motivation is... You know, why, why did he behave like this? It's sort of extraordinary. I mean, at one level, it's unextraordinary because it's peak Scott Morrison, but at another level, it's kind of bizarre. And I think there was one little tiny thing that really caught my eye, uh, that Morrison swore himself into the finance portfolio in order to have that minister's advance during the pandemic because he was making decisions with the premiers, not with his own cabinet. Mm. And that was a real feature during the pandemic is that Morrison's own cabinet was entirely sidelined for at least half that term. And I sort of wondered, I guess, whether, whether Morrison got into a mindset that his own cabinet didn't matter, he was the only decision maker who mattered and therefore he needed to do all this extraordinary shadowing. I just, I'm, I'm we, just curious we knew it. We knew his own colleagues, Scott Morrison's own colleagues, were pretty unhappy about all of this, but Nikki, in your, your book, Bulldozed, you've got them on the record, those who were working the closest with <laughs> uh, the then Prime Minister, and to say they weren't happy is putting it mildly. Well, uh, they're furious um, with him, and I think the general view is that... Um, he showed contempt for them, for the people who were closest to him, um, who followed him religiously in, in many ways and were loyal to a fault. And he treated them with contempt. He treated Cabinet with contempt and he treated Parliament and parliamentary processes with contempt for whatever reason. None of the reasons that he has given stack up except it sounds like he was deluded, right? Um, he was power hungry, um, you know, he didn't trust anybody, he was isolated, he was mistrustful. They were loyal completely to him and he treated them like dirt. So the view is now, I think, amongst them, that he should just pack his bags and go. Do you think he, do you think he would? Uh, he, he took to Facebook uh, in response to this inquiry, James. He said... Um, as Prime Minister, my awareness of issues regarding national security and the national interest was broader than that known to individual ministers and certainly to the inquiry. Doesn't sound like he's making any uh, apologies here for what he did. No, he's not. Um, and he's not really providing any explanation that makes any sense to anyone. I'm not even sure even to himself. But as to your first question, where does this leave his political career? He doesn't have one. I, I think he's actually no longer really interested in things of this world. I think Scott Morrison's next 
uh, role in life it will be back to the church. I think he's very, you know, I think, I think he's sort of moved on from the things of the flesh. Just quickly before we leave this topic, um, Cabinet will tomorrow consider what Parliament should do about this. Um, from what I understand, it's, it's highly likely, and I might ask Tony Burke about this in a moment, uh, that, that the government will um, seek a, a motion to either censure or somehow reprimand Scott Morrison in the Parliament. Mm. And Catherine, just quickly, that'll put Peter Dutton in a pretty <laughs> awkward position. Oh, well, yeah, just a fraction. Uh, and, and not to mention that the Prime Minister, former Prime Minister himself, is still in the Parliament witnessing this. Mm. So, yes, look, I, I think... Why do you think he's going to struggle with that? Why do you think Dutton's going to struggle with, with censuring Scott Morrison? You think he do it? But, but why? Well, it's a good way to put a line between the two of them, isn't it? Well, so far, they've done very little to separate themselves from Morrison. Um, even yesterday, uh, Paul Fletcher was out there saying, well, why doesn't the government get on with real business like cost of living? Cost of living is important, but so is the protection mm. of democracy. But they seem to have put that way down at the bottom well, I would, of I, their I, list I, of the priorities. Point is, who is his best, his best I mean, mate? Stuart seriously. Roberts put, him, put some distance but the point between him, wasn't it? I know. <laughs> just, any, any opposition... I'm just processing that in real <laughs> no, time. No. But any opposition <laughs> yeah. needs to protect their legacy from their time in government. This is going to be critical mm. for their chances of trying to convince voters mm. to put them back in. But you're censuring the bloke who was your leader. Yes, but they've all said they didn't know anything about it and they've all said it's weird. So why not? It's not a bridge that too, too far. I mean, right. see, which, which is... It's their face... It's lesser of two evilisms, isn't it? Which is looking worse? Censuring him or defending him? What's the political question? Well, you know, it's awkward. Well, it's all awkward. But, that, but, that's, but that's, what that's where they are, isn't yeah. it? I mean, I'm not saying, you know, you, you wouldn't start from here, but that's where they're that's at. They are. All right. <laughs> Time to shift to the current government and its efforts to pass <laughs> industrial relations reforms before Parliament wraps up for the year. Before we speak to the Minister responsible, Tony Burke, he was the Reserve Bank Governor this week, issuing a warning on wages. And let's say we all accepted the idea, which there's a natural appeal to this, inflation 7%. I should be compensated for that in my wages. If that were to happen, what do you think inflation would be next year? 7% plus or minus. And then we've well, got to get compensated for that? 7%, 7 And this is what happened in the 70s and 80s, and as I talked about, that turned out to be a disaster. If we all buy into the idea that wages have to go up to compensate people for inflation, it will be painful. So best avoid that. Tony Burke, welcome to the program. Hi, David. Before we get to where you're at with the negotiations uh, with the Senate crossbench, just on that point from the Reserve Bank Governor we heard during the week, uh, he says we've got to avoid the idea that wages have to go up to compensate for inflation. Is he right? Well, the system's not capable of chasing headline inflation. And if you even look at the words of the Reserve Bank Governor, he's made clear that at the moment, uh, the wage prices, the wage inflation that we have, sort of the wage increases that we have, uh, are having no impact on the current inflation rate. I'm sorry, I'm just telling you, I'm hearing an echo. So. We'll, we'll get that addressed. Uh, apologies, we'll get that fixed up. Well, let's turn then to where you're up to in negotiations uh, with the, uh, the Senate crossbench. Uh, I understand you've had some progress over the last 24 hours or so. Yeah, a lot's happened since I first agreed to the interview. Uh, as late as 8.30 last night, there's a reason why I'm in Canberra, uh, Senator David Pocock and I were still meeting, uh, and I can say now that we are confident that the Secure Jobs Better Pay Bill will pass the Parliament this year uh, with the support of Senator David Pocock. So it will pass with his support. He's given you that confirmation? That's right. That's right. And what have you had to give to secure that commitment? Yeah, it's... Uh, look, I've, it hasn't been an easy negotiation. And uh, Senator Pocock's been very clear on a series of the principles that he wanted to look at. He, when, when it was, as you know, he would have preferred that everything uh, was dealt with next year when we said we wanted to make decisions this year. It's involved a very intense process, a lot of meetings, a lot of detail. Uh, there's effectively three sorts of issues uh, that have come to the fore. Uh, one is with respect to small business. The other is low paid workers. And finally, a concern that he has that's outside of my portfolio, uh, but is part of the agreement that goes to structural issues that we can put in place to deal with people who are within the payment system. So if I 
If I go through Let's each go of those each, quickly yeah. for you, yeah. Uh, in terms of small business, we'll be adopting all the recommendations of the Senate inquiry, including the shift to the small business headcount going to 20 uh, to be excluded from that single interest stream. Mm -hmm. But we've also uh, put in an extra marker where effectively for small businesses that have fewer than 50 employees, it becomes easier for them to argue to the Commission uh, that they don't believe that it's reasonable, that they're not uh, reasonably comparative to the reasonably comparable to the other businesses within a multi-employer bargain and to be able to get out. So there's an easier process for businesses with fewer than 50 employees. In terms of workers, uh, to make sure that we don't run into the same problem that happened with the previous low paid stream where you had a section of a bill of an act that looked fantastic but nobody could get into it, uh, a capacity to make sure that specific occupations can be deemed to be part of that supported stream for low paid workers. And finally, there'll be outside of my portfolio, so I can just give you the, the high points of it, uh, there'll be a new statutory advisory committee made up of experts that in the lead up to every budget will provide independent advice as to the structural challenges on economic inclusion uh, as well as going all the way through to looking at the different rules and the levels of payments uh, to provide independent advice to the government as those budgets are put together and at least two weeks before each budget uh, they would make information public uh, that would then you know, make clear the different challenges. And this is very much to take account of what Senator David pocock has been saying with respect to some of the some of the poorest people in the country. So you're talking about you make sure job seeker payments, process. Uh, parenting payments, those sorts of payments, each budget getting uh, independent uh, um, expert advice that's made public that says they're either you know, inadequate or not. That's right. Okay. That's exactly right. And, right. It'll, it'll get, and there's a lot of interaction between uh, different payments and different allowances, okay. so it'll have the capacity to do all that. Let me come back to the areas that are within your portfolio that you, that yeah. you mentioned there. So the headcount on small business as to which businesses are exempt from multi-employer bargaining, it will now be 20. Is that uh, 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 part-time and full-time casuals inclusive? It's a, it's a headcount using the headcount principles that are already okay. that are already there. I mean, you 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 won't be able to game it with you know sudden upping or downing of casuals who are just on the books and aren't getting shifts and things like that. There's principles within the act already that that hold to that. Okay, and if a childcare centre has more than twenty staff, they would still be able to um, be involved in uh, be involved in multi-employer bargaining through the low-paid stream. Is that right? That's right, and to, to avoid the risk that going to 20 might mean that some uh, early childhood educators, in fact, if they, if they had a pay rise through the first round of bargaining that then pushed them out of that low, lower paid stream, uh, that deeming provision that I referred to would create a situation where we could keep them in that right. stream, which has the added advantage of keeping the funder at the table, which for a series of those feminised industries is essential. And those businesses with a headcount up to 50, uh, you mentioned they will have a stronger ability to argue it's unreasonable uh, for them to be included in multi-employer bargaining or that they're not comparable to other uh, yeah. em employers. Yeah. Well, just explain that to me. OK, so the, the, there's a new test within the common interest test that's being added. It's being added for everybody uh, as to whether the businesses are reasonably comparable. So that's the, the new test that's there. Uh, so, for example, if a business says, look, we've actually got nothing to do, not enough to do with these other businesses that are in the multi-employer stream, uh, if you're fewer than 50, uh, it's effectively the case has to be made uh, that you should be included. Uh, and that makes it much easier for small businesses, not like there's an onus on So the on onus would be on the, on the union, for example, to, right. to make the case that these two businesses are similar enough that they should right. be... That's right, for under 50, it'd be the other way for more than 50. All right, can I ask you though, there's still concern uh, amongst bigger businesses, mining and aviation and others, about what multi-employer bargaining will mean for them. Will it, for example, mean that uh, airline crews at Qantas and Jetstar and, and Virgin all have to be paid or, or could be paid uh, at the same rate? Look, the reasonable, reasonable comparable test will apply 
to, to everybody, it's just the owner shifts above and below 50. So that's something that larger businesses have been asking to, to have that taken into account and that'll be available. These judgment call decisions are made by the Commission. Uh, but I've got to say, you know, where you, you, have, um, you, ha you have situations like what you just described, the public interest test would come into, into play there as well. And it's where, you know, the, the opposition have constantly wanted to characterise this as industry-wide or sector-wide bargaining. Could it it's be, though? It's not that. Could, could it's it be? It's multiple. It's mul I'm not going to get in front of making judgments on behalf of the Fair Work Commission and no but they, they would. could they could apply an industry-wide aviation deal like that. Well, the concept of the Act is multi-employer, not, not industry-wide. So you never get to say, mm. because you're in the industry, everybody's in. That's not how this legislation is drafted. That principle doesn't happen. What happens is employers either opt in or their workforce votes to opt in. And then, the, before the Fair Work Commission, they have to work out whether there's a common interest, whether that's reasonably comparable, and also whether or not it's in the public interest. Okay. And where you go sector-wide for sectors that are critical to the national economy, at that point it's pretty hard to see things passing the public interest test. Will, uh, will Parliament uh, still have to sit on, well at least the House, have to sit on Saturday, as, as has been the plan as I understand it? That's right. I was, I was astonished yesterday to see the opposition uh, complaining that they might have to turn up on a Saturday. I think there's plenty of Australian workers knowing what's at stake with wages that haven't been moving for, for a decade that would just be shaking their heads about that particular objection. So what will happen on the Thursday afternoon, uh, we will suspend rather than adjourn the House and then on Saturday morning at 9 o'clock we'll come back. No matter what happens and no matter how quickly the Secure Jobs Better Pay get, bill gets through, uh, there'll still be other legislation going through the Senate. There'll still be amendments that'll need to be considered by the House and we'll be here on Saturday to be able to deal with that. And then that's it? You won't need any more than that? Well, if the Senate has finished, uh, then <laughs> we, we simply deal, crossed. Deal, deal with what the, the Senate said. But they've been quite clear that they believe they can manage everything uh, by the Friday. And I know as a member of the House, you, you never comment on Senate procedures. You leave that to Katie Gallagher and Penny Wong. Probably wise. Uh, look, finally, on another matter, we've been talking about the former Prime Minister, Scott Morrison. I know Cabinet will look at this tomorrow. What's your view as Leader of the House? Should Parliament have an opportunity to make its views clear with either a censure or some other type of reprimand of uh, what happened with those secret ministries? I'll leave the, the decision, obviously, to the, the Cabinet deliberations that are tomorrow. But one of the things that's really interesting in the Bell report uh, is Justice Bell has specifically quoted the comments from the Solicitor-General uh, that the principles of responsible government were fundamentally undermined. Now, the Parliament is where you have responsible government. If you're not allowed to know who the ministers are when you're directing questions, the whole concept collapses. And what happened with, the, with what Scott Morrison did wasn't simply a decision of him on this particular matter. It had been enabled by behaviour for years. And people who are sort of surprised that he did this to them as ministers are the same people who sat in the chamber voting that no one else would get to speak on legislation. The same people who were quite happy with there being a cabinet committee with only one member of it. Okay, well, it's got to be, uh, it's got to be irresistible. Involved in this. It's got to be irresistible, right, to move a censure motion and, um, and put the Liberals in a rather awkward I'm, position. I'm not going to get ahead of the cabinet deliberations, right. nor should I. Tony Burke, appreciate you joining us this morning. Thank you. Good to talk. Let's get back to our panel. We're joined once again by Nikki Sava, James Campbell and Catherine Murphy. Deal done, Catherine, mm -hmm. uh, on IR. By the sounds of it, David Pocock last night, uh, around 8.30, signed up. A few changes there. What do you make of it? Well, uh, I'm, I think it's... Uh, obviously, Senator Pocock has been working through various issues that have been most difficult for stakeholders to come to terms with. Uh, but I think very interestingly associated with this deal, uh, uh, there's an agreement from the government to have a legislated process to review 
support payments that's sitting outside the IR framework before every budget, basically, to check whether the support payments are adequate or not. Now, This is an interesting it, development. I mean, it doesn't guarantee a, no, a course, higher payment. It but... doesn't, no, but it, it, but it guarantees a process of deliberation and a report to be published uh, which will, you know, recommend certain courses of action which the government will either have to take up or not. So for a bunch of uh, people who have been campaigning around Raise the Rate... Mm. for many years, this is, this is a sort of significant structural underpinning for that campaign. So I'm, I'm quite interested in that. Yeah, I, I think it'll be interesting. They'll have to justify if they're not going to top up uh, JobSeeker and yeah. so on why they're not because of this, yeah. this new expert panel. Um, on the industrial relations changes, though, uh, James, clearly a lot of the business lobby groups still won't be happy with where this has landed, but there is a bit of movement there on the headcount for small business, a bit of movement well, the business, on a few other things. The, the business lobby groups have, have had to sort of find a... You know, they've, they've struggled to find a reason to existence for a while. Uh, what was interesting about this bill was that there wasn't initially that much uh, reaction to it. It took, it took a while for a bit of head of steam and you suddenly had all these people in industry associations uh, suddenly sort of trying to justify, justify their existences, I, th I think, to a certain extent. I'm, I mean, I, 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 I'm on the record, I've written a few times now, I, I think that the claims of the changes that this thing's going to bring in are, are wildly overblown. Uh, you know, we have an, already have an extremely, you know, complex and bureaucratic and uh, labour relations system in this country that no one else in the world has copied. Um, this is really just a tweak to it. Um, now, I could be wrong and we could find that, that you know, that, that we're back in the you know, 1970s Britain in about five minutes, but somehow I don't think that's going to be the case for the simple reason that the private sector coverage of small business in this country is, is, is non-existent. And as soon as you move up the chain into larger businesses, you pretty quickly find yourself locked into cartel world. And they all don't really have all that much difficulty uh, f with, with, with labour relations. And I mean, the other thing is the, the ease with which, for example, uh, the, they managed to remove the building sector from this bill without any uh, protests at all from the most apparently the most militant union in the country was surprising until you realise, of course, they already have pattern bargaining in the building industry, certainly in Victoria and Queensland and uh, to a certain extent in South Australia. So, I mean, I'm, I could be wrong, but I reckon that, that there's a lot of uh, Look, I think carrying on about I, this. I think with, with this reform, a, a lot of it's kind of... We'll, we'll know once it's in, right, what impact it has. And you're kind of making that point as well. Uh, that, that's true, isn't it, Nikki? There are concerns. Uh, you know, I mentioned the airlines. They're worried about this and so on. And some of the miners are worried about this. We'll see how it plays out. There's a bit more comfort there, I suppose, for businesses up to 50 headcount now where they'll be able... The, the onus won't be on them. Uh, the onus will be on the unions to show that they should be roped into a multi-employer deal. Mm. Um, and, look, Accia's expressed uh, concerns as well. But I think, you know, one of the really interesting things about the, um, the way that the government has gone um, about this is the willingness to uh, consult. But also they're lucky that they've got someone like Pocock who is, um, you know, holding the balance of power. Yeah, how does he come out of this? Well, I think he comes out of it extremely well. And, um, you know, he comes across as sensible and centrist and he's looking for outcomes and he's not playing games. He's not a, you know, he's a little bit of a publicity hound, but not, not a huge one. Yeah, he's, a, he's, a, he's a Senate crossbencher with the swing vote, you know. It's, uh, <laughs> yes. It, it comes with it a yes, fair bit of publicity. Yes, but he's not a madman, you know. He's not a mad... And he's, he's maintained no horse trading, but he has got them voting uh, in this final week on something that's pretty important to Territorians, right? This is the Territory Rights Bill. Of course, but on what, issues that are important But what's that, that thing was talking about? Him, that's, cross, it, that's horse trading, isn't it? But it's not extreme stuff. stuff. You know, it's not extreme stuff that he's going for. Mm. He's going for, I think, um, what are quite sensible and workable uh, solutions that will improve uh, what the government had put forward. And I can tell you that a lot of my uh, Liberal friends who voted for Pocock um, to get rid of Zed are very happy with their choice because of the way he's going about his job. What about the, the government? I mean, they'll be... Um... They'll be quite chuffed to finish the parliamentary year getting this IR bill through. There's a lot of criticism. The opposition, uh, I thought in particular over the last week, turned their guns on this in Parliament. You know, they were, they were focused on the, the cost of business, the regulatory costs, all of this. 
but if the government, yes, they've rushed this, but if they can get it done, uh, as well as, you know, the list of other things they've achieved in six months, they'd be pretty happy. Oh, well, it'd be like hitting, being hit in the backside with a rainbow, <laughs> won't it? I mean, it's sort of... It has been, uh, you know, a, a, very, a very good run, mm. the first six months of this government, in terms of them being able to check key things on their to-do list politically, and this is one of them. I mean, they move quickly on patent bargaining uh, in terms of this legislation. They could have waited till next year. Multi-employer bargaining. But, sorry, 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 <laughs> wrong lingo. What am I saying? Sorry. No, they did move quickly on this rather than wait, wait until the next year. They wanted to use their political capital to achieve certain things quickly. Mm. They've got about doing that. We've got the Integrity Commission. We've got the climate stuff. We've got this stuff now, uh, which sets them up uh, to have a wages story, which is very important mm. because I mean, the... obviously... Inflation has blown their whole wages strategy out of the water. The danger will be, of course, if that cost of living continues to be a real sore uh, and we start to get more industrial action under this change. I mean, again, we'll see what happens, but um, that would be the only concern for Well, them. Well, it's a risk, but it's sort of, I think, James's point is that the mm. economy is... We're not in the 1980s economy anymore, are we? And, look, obviously there may be more disputation. And, and the point of this is actually to increase wages. Sorry, guys. It is to increase wages because that's actually good for the economy. Mm. So, uh, you know, maybe there's more disputation, but, uh, but it's important to have something to say on wages, isn't it? What about the complaints over sitting on a Saturday? Um, uh, Paul Fletcher was out and about yesterday, uh, I think, uh, decrying all of this. Um, Nikki? Big deal. <laughs> Lots of people have to work on Saturday, so I can't understand uh, what the objection is there. It sounds sensible to me. I would have thought they'd be relieved not to be getting another week of sitting of Parliament yeah. after this week, but anyway. Yeah. Uh, Stuart Robert has found himself defending his integrity uh, again, uh, uh, this time after Nick McKenzie in the Nine newspapers dropped another exclusive. I'm not paid for it. I don't get anything for it. Uh, I assist people. I wasn't responsible for anything. And I continue to meet with stakeholders as all MPs do. James, what's he done this time? Well, at the very least, he has been using his position as a member of parliament, ha having meetings with all sorts of people, many of them representatives of foreign governments, taking the information he's gained from those meetings and steering his mates towards the business opportunities. Now, I suspect, I could be wrong, that Stuart Robert is very, very lucky in that the cache of emails that have come to light only apply to a pit to the happy period when he was on the back bench. Because, as you, you will remember, you that period was bookended by two terms in the ministry. What I'd like to read is the emails during his time uh, when he held a commission in the government. Mm. Where a code of conduct would apply to a... Oh, and, you, and not only that, one has access to enormously, you know, more detailed tranches of information as a minister than one does as a humble backbencher. Are you, are you carrying your kit yeah, bag we, around I for the... I want to be careful here about, uh, you know, any allegations made, but are you suggesting there is some material relating to his time as minister that could be incriminating here? Look, we're getting an anti-corruption commission, David, and it'll just be very interesting to see where they head. From what we know... <laughs> all right, there's a little tease there. From what we know, Nikki, uh, of uh, what's the group called Synergy 360, um, what is, is what Stuart Robert did here in, you know, the emails that we've seen uh, suggest that he is in the wrong? Um... He says he's done nothing improper and he didn't accept money, but it obviously is a terrible look. And um, I think we're, you know, sort of alluding to a code of ethics uh, before uh, for backbenchers. Um, do we need one of those? Yeah, I think we do. Obviously we do. Look, you wouldn't think that we'd need to tell a Prime Minister that he can't swear himself secretly into portfolios, right? But... Yeah, we do. We need to fix that. So I think we should address this as well, especially with the NAC uh, coming in. I think there should be a clear code of how they should conduct themselves. Yeah, because it's sort of the whole case uh, sort of goes to this point about this grey zone.
that politics sort of operates in. It's a highly networked business. It's important that people know what's happening, have relationships, can trade information. It's how the whole system works. But there is this grey zone that exists in politics. And the more voters or the closer voters get to being able to see that, the more repelled they are by it because it, it reinforces this idea that there's one set of rules, one set of culture, one set of norms for our democratically elected representatives, and then there's another set of norms for them. And so it's like, I'm sure the bulk of people actually in politics actually know how to conduct themselves, but there are people in politics who don't seem to know how to conduct themselves because there is this grey zone. So at the moment, just to spell out what happens at the moment, if you're a backbencher, if, if you were getting a payment, which in this case Stuart Robert was not, says he was not, if you're getting a payment, you'd have to declare that, wouldn't you? On the, well, you'd have to on declare the, the income. So what would yeah. a code of conduct change? What would, would, would you have to, what, declare meetings that you're lining up for someone or well, well, you should. what would that fix in you this should. situation? You should, you should declare these things. I mean, in some jurisdictions, you know, all meetings with premiers are on the public record, for example. But the Prime Minister doesn't even do that here. Yeah, so what would a backbencher... Or arguably, they should. they should, and premiers should and, and all of that, but would a backbencher have to detail all their meetings and contacts? Or what, was it, what would well, a code I, of conduct I think, change? yes, if they were lobbying on behalf of... Um, a corporation that was angling for government contracts, well, of course that should be made public. Mm. Um, you know, there should be a register of that and everybody should have to declare. Um, the more transparency, um, the better. The more and people shouldn't perhaps be conducting what looks to be quasi-government or, you know, public business through Gmail accounts, just as a starting point, perhaps. Good advice. Uh, our panel, Nikki Savage, James Campbell and Catherine Murphy, will be back shortly with some final observations. Time now for Mike Bowers and Talking Pictures. I'm Mike Bowers and I'm photographer at large for The Guardian Australia. I'm talking pictures this morning with columnist for The Australian, the one and only Jack the Insider, and a very warm welcome to the penultimate talking pictures for penultimate. 2023. Yes, I'm normally the judge, but I actually appointed myself five judges. Right. And uh, and obviously they've gone in my head. Yeah. It's completely <laughs> mega maniacal oh. display. It was nice to see Josh come out this week. And yes. <laughs> Full-throated support <laughs> to his former buddy. Well, you know, <laughs> these five secret ministries uh, were never going to play well with with colleagues, were they? All the government seems to want for Christmas is industrial relations reform, but it doesn't seem like everyone's in a giving mood. No. Will David Pocock be Santa or the Grinch? Yes, it remains to be seen, doesn't it? But Albo has said you'll be staying back after, yeah, you... <laughs> after school if you don't knock this over. It's a mixed class, the, the class of 2023. It there's, is. Um, um, Tammy Tyrrell and uh, David Pocock, and then there's uh, Rennick, Antic, in Canavan. Canavan there, yes, yes. And it looks like uh, David has got the weight of the world upon his shoulders there. Yes, and he's looking skyward for inspiration. Yes, I think. yes. Beautiful David Rowe. Beautifully drawn, the, isn't the, it? The Peacock and Lambie Industrial Relations Reform. Mm. Uh -hum. Uh -hum. Yeah. Poking out between the feathers there. Yep. A Jack, beautiful David Pope cartoon. Mm -hmm. Yes. Dear Gov, if you're listening, Please exempt my business from the industry-wide wage rises. We need to lift what workers have to spend in businesses like mine. Yeah, multi-employer bargaining. Multi-employer bargaining, but please exempt me. <laughs> yeah. I thought for my money this was possibly cartoon of the week. Uh, Matt Golding, the business reaction to dealing with stagnant wage growth. The <laughs> sky will fall in, yeah. the sky yeah. will fall in. The wages go up, then yep. they tend to just be consumed. Yep. But here we've got some backdrop here. Wages going down. Profits going up. And the, the, the large towers which seem to be above the clouds. Above the clouds. Yeah. I did love this um, very good. David Pope cartoon on the new Knack watchdog, which has got the watchdog in the, the fitting <laughs> chair and Helen Haynes. Helen here. Haynes got the big teeth. Yeah. And she's saying, I've made an independent model of the teeth it's going to need. Yes, or which look pretty sharp. More incisors though. Yeah, I'd yeah. like them to be yeah, sharper. Yeah, sharper ones at the front. We'd rather work backwards from a bipartisan model of the major party asses. We don't want it coming back to 
bite. Yeah, yeah. very, very good. Yeah. And there's Elbow there holding an ass. Jack, there were hopes for a real change at the latest Climbers Conference, but they didn't really? manage to charm or shake things up very much, it seems. <laughs> no, this is yeah. uh, Megan Herbert's cartoon yeah. here, and that's the, the bucket. Loss and damage fund, and they're on the Cop Out 27 boat. We'll talk about putting money in it next year, but it should bail you out until then. Jack, a uh, lovely Alan Moyer, who has got the Cop 27 arc partially the built arc here. arc is being built, yes, yeah. yes, indeed. It doesn't look terribly seaworthy, though, <laughs> at the moment. Well, it's a work in progress. Work in progress, yes. 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 They all look pretty happy with themselves. They are very happy. Look, look at that. Yeah, Liz, Wonderful magnificent. Work. COP27, fingers yes, crossed. Fingers crossed. Matt Golding, cartoon, a CSRO climate report. If you don't like the extreme weather event we're having, wait five minutes. Yeah, there Four you go. extremes in one day. That's Melbourne weather, isn't it? Jack, it's been a great pleasure unpicking the events this week. I'll let you do the honours. Thank you, Mike. It's back to you, Spearsy. Thank you, Jack. Thank you, Mike. Uh, Final observations, just a, a reminder, a shout out, quarterly essay from Catherine Murphy's out tomorrow. Nikki Bulldozed is out Thursday in Thursday, the bookshops, just yeah. in time for Christmas. Catherine. Thank you, David. Um, uh, this is this observation slightly stranded by industrial peace in our time, <laughs> but I will make it again anyway. I think it's just an interesting thing. Uh, obviously, when we hit these end of year parliamentary sitting crunch, crunch points where there's a million things to do and not enough time to do it, and we're threatening to spill over into other sittings, the key kingmaker in this parliament, David Pocock, of course, is a resident of the ACT. Mm. Normally, the government of the day can rely on senators to want to go home, not to put too fine a point on it. Uh, the key kingmaker in this parliament lives in Canberra, <laughs> has a short commute to his home, therefore can maximise his own position in relation to that. So I just think that's an interesting feature of this parliament. For the next three years. For the next three years. Yep. James. While most of the ALP was concentrated on the state election, a small but important segment of it has been concentrated on another election, which is the election for the Transport Workers Union. Now, the Transport Workers Union down here is a key right union. It's part of the architecture of the uh, current governing arrangements in the, in the ALP that allows the SL to dominate. Uh, it's, I'm told that the, this election, it's a challenging it's a challenge to the incumbency which it very rarely gets up is likely to get up might get up in which case all of the factional you know game uh, board game that is the ALP in Victoria gets turned over again oh joy all right uh, Nikki okay so uh, the last time I think that a prime minister slipped so easily and comfortably into the job was John Howard and um, I think Anthony Albanese has such a strong uh, front bench team they're putting uh, relations with uh, China back on track. They've shown they're not frightened to take on reform and policy changes, even though they can be very messy and very hard. And so I think in the six months that they've been there, um, they've uh, not only exceeded expectations, but I think they've actually done very, very well. All right. Thank you all very much for that this morning. Busy show. Don't forget to check out the Insiders Back to You podcast. Send us your questions via the ABC Listen app or an email to backtoyoupodcast at abc.net.au. And next week is our final show of the year. We'll have the Matt Price moment celebrating the most excruciating moments of the year and the terrific wrap-up too of a huge 12 months in politics. Now, finally, if you have trouble spelling, don't worry, you're not alone. Even Prime Ministers struggle with some words, as we saw when Anthony Albanese met winners of the Prime Minister's Spelling Bee competition this week and was put on the spot. We'll leave you with that. Thanks for watching. Magnanimous. Magnanimous. M-A-G-N-A-M-L-I. M-A-G-M? No, M-A-G-N. M. Yeah. Max. That's what you said. No, that's what the promise said. N A N I. Ah, okay. You're making us all feel very excited about being here.